The sands of Egypt hide thousands of years of history. Monuments to ancient civilizations dominate the landscape. But for sun-loving Europeans, Egypt is also a resort destination, where the most important sand is on the beach. The town of Sharm el-Sheikh is several hundred kilometers southeast of Cairo. Perched on the Red Sea, it's a natural destination for people looking for a little rest and relaxation. Sharm el-Sheikh is quite popular with Europeans. The reason is, where can you get very warm sea with a five-hour flight? And you have the Red Sea, which is crystal clear, beautiful mountains. It's just extraordinary. The city's popularity is growing. More than four million people a year use Sharm el-Sheikh's airport. In the early days of 2004, tourists aren't the only ones drawn to the local beaches. British Prime Minister Tony Blair is also in the region visiting Egyptian leader Hosni Mubarak. Just after two in the morning on January the 3rd, Many vacationers are still out on the town. But 53-year-old Captain Kader Abdullah is just starting his day. He's renowned for his punctuality. A former officer in the Egyptian Air Force, Kader is now a highly respected captain with the charter company Flash Airlines. He always liked to pack his own suitcase. He wouldn't let me do it for him. He always said, I would like to prepare my own things to make sure I don't forget anything. He was very precise on what he wanted and what he would take with him. Captain Kader meets up with his 25-year-old first officer, Amar El Shafi. Together, they'll fly out of Sharm el-Sheikh, heading for Paris. Good morning. Good morning, sir. El Shafi is young enough to be the captain's son. The early morning flight isn't for everyone. Pascal Mercier and his family are supposed to be on the flash jet, but changed their plans. I was booked on the Flash Island flight. When my agency told me that I had to wake up very early and then we had to change planes in Cairo, I said, this is really stupid. I mean, if my daughter was like two years old and the other ones were like six and eight. So really, I didn't feel comfortable about changing planes and so on. For other tourists, the cheap tickets that Flash offers are worth the trouble of getting up early. France Toulier was able to bring his entire family to Egypt. They need the break. My brother-in-law had just lost his father, so he brought his children, his mother and his wife there just to have a good time. Not to see the sites or anything, just to have a good time. That's what Sharm El Sheikh is known for. Fatima Hijaji is also heading back to Paris after a vacation in Sharm. The mother of five is flying alone. Before takeoff, she calls her nephew in France. Hi. I was asleep when she called. I didn't really want to get into a conversation with her. She was someone who called you for everything. She needed to be reassured. So, even though she had the five or six hour flight ahead of her, she just wanted to make sure that I would be there to pick her up at the airport. 
In all, 148 passengers and crew settle into their seats aboard the jet. It's 5 a.m. In the cockpit, Ashraf Abdel Hamid is the third member of the crew. He's training as a first officer, although he's worked for years piloting corporate jets. None of the crew members are happy with the poor quality of the weather information they're getting from the local air traffic controller. They didn't say sky clear, they said clouds and sky clear. How? The two are opposite. Ask them about ceiling. No ceiling and clouds and sky clear. Maybe it's scattered. Maybe he means scatter. Good morning. The captain is also frustrated that one of his instruments isn't working. Although the engineer agrees there's a problem, it's not serious enough to fix. The men laugh it off at the expense of the first officer. It's probably called by Ma, making a heavy landing. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Captain Kader and his entire crew, we welcome you on board Flash Airlines Boeing 737-300. It's still hours before dawn when the plane lifts off. The Flash Airlines flight will head out over the Red Sea before turning towards Cairo. The jet climbs through a pitch black night. Without a moon to light the scene, it's hard for the passengers to see much of anything outside their windows. In the cockpit, the simple turn over the Red Sea is taking a bizarre twist. See what the aircraft just did? Captain Kader doesn't like the way his plane is behaving. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. Turning right? How turning right? The plane is supposed to be turning left on its way to Cairo. Instead, it's turning in the opposite direction. The captain tries to get his plane back on course, but his situation just gets worse. Overbank. Knowing he's in trouble, the captain tells the first officer to engage the autopilot. Autopilot! Autopilot! But it doesn't work. No autopilot, Commander! The 737 is now flying almost completely on its side. The plane gains speed as it spirals towards the Red Sea. Just minutes after takeoff, the plane is out of control. Diving towards the water, it's traveling at more than 700 kilometers an hour. Everyone on board is running out of time. Just minutes after takeoff, an early morning flight has become a desperate battle for survival. A passenger jet filled with French families is plunging towards the Red Sea. Everyone on board can feel the tremendous speed and gut-wrenching turns. The enormous G-forces are making it difficult for Captain Kader Abdullah to fly the plane. Ashraf Abdel Hamid, the third member of the flight crew, tells the captain to slow the plane down. Retard power! Retard power! Retard power! The plane is traveling so fast it's threatening to tear itself apart. After flying almost upside down, the crew is finally beginning to bring their plane under control. Then they hear the ground proximity warning. 
They're getting dangerously close to the Red Sea. Pascal Mercier and his family are staying at a beachfront hotel. My daughter woke up suddenly screaming like hell, screaming like if something happened. I didn't hear the crash, but maybe she did. It's okay. It's just before five in the morning minutes after the plane took off from the airport. It's disappeared from local radar screens. By the time the sun rises, the crash site is found, but there's little for rescuers to do. The plane shattered on impact. A postcard is found saying simply, I think this card will arrive after me. Pieces of debris litter the surface, but most of the plane has sunk beneath the waves. There are no survivors. All 148 people on board the plane are dead. Flight 604 was to land at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris in the morning. As family and friends wait, officials list the plane as delayed and then slowly break the news of the accident. They ask me, are you waiting for someone from Sharm el-Sheikh? You say, yes. Then they say, could you come with us? We are going to take you to a hotel. At the hotel, we'll explain it all to you. It was very strange since we were greeted in an hotel and we passed people who were leaving happy because they were looking for the same information as us, but their families were not on the list. They came with a paper in hand. Here, yes, Madame Hijaji, Fatima. We apologize that you have to learn it this way, but she's dead. Later, on his voicemail, Mohammed Hijaji hears Fatima's message sent during the flight. I heard a scream, a noise. After that, I didn't hear anything. Captain Kader's wife hears about the crash from her son. My son called me from abroad and told me that he had heard there was an accident in Flash Airlines. I was in disbelief for a while until it became reality. It was a very big shock for me. In resort hotels, workers check the empty rooms of those who were on Flight 604. but one of the rooms is occupied. Mr. Mercy. This guy from the hotel, the, the hotel staff, began to cry. He was really shocked, happily shocked to see us. He thought we were in the flight with everybody else. <laughs> they're, they're here. In my hotel, 82 people were on that flight. 82 people. It was a really, really strange, really, really heavy. But we were really lucky. There had been no mayday call from the plane, no warning to air traffic control that something was wrong. With the plane crashing just minutes after it left the airport, there are immediate concerns that a bomb had brought the jet down. The plane had just taken off, and it looked very strange why this accident happened so quickly after takeoff. When investigators examined the plane's flight path, 
They discover it would have gone directly over the town where Egyptian leader Hosni Mubarak kept a vacation home. It's also close to the house where British Prime Minister Tony Blair and his family were staying. Blair and his family were supposed to leave from the same airport that day. Security around the Prime Minister is immediately heightened. Two days after the crash, authorities receive a phone call. Terrorists from Yemen claim responsibility for the crash. They say it's a protest against a French law banning the Muslim headscarf, the hijab, in public schools. But in spite of the phone call and the rumors swirling around Egypt, Investigators quickly rule out terrorism. If you have a wreckage distributed of a very large area, that means the plane was disintegrating in the air, and due to an explosion, it would be disintegrating on a wide area. In this case, there was very, very few pieces, and all located in a very small area. So this indicated that the plane was intact and went into the water intact. If it wasn't terrorism, what had ripped the plane from the sky so quickly? Investigators face an enormous challenge. The plane has sunk below the surface of the Red Sea. Divers have to fight off sharks that are drawn to the carnage. The rescue teams find few bodies intact. The aircraft and most of the 148 passengers and crew have sunk over 1,000 meters to the bottom of the Red Sea. The first task of investigators is to find the aircraft's flight data and cockpit voice recorders, the black boxes. If they survived the crash, they will now be on the seabed. but this part of the Red Sea has never been charted. With so many French tourists involved, the French government offers to help in any way it can. The French immediately responded by sending a boat specially equipped with robots to uh, search the bottom of the, uh, of the sea. But the wreckage is too deep. The sub that the French boat has can't survive the enormous pressure at the bottom of the sea. The investigators desperately need another submarine. But they're running out of time. The black box transmits a radio signal, but the battery only lasts for 30 days. If investigators can't find it within a month, the mystery of Flight 604 may never be solved. Getting to the black boxes before the time the pingers stopped transmitting was always a very worrisome aspect to all the investigation team. Everybody was working uh, 24 hours around the clock to try to salvage these and try to locate them first. While the recovery effort continues, family and friends of the victims begin to mourn those who died. They pressure investigators to solve the mystery. It's the biggest air disaster involving French nationals, the biggest in the history of civil aviation. American, French, and Egyptian experts join forces. While waiting for the plane's black boxes to be recovered, they also begin focusing on Flash Airlines itself. Flying just two planes, it was one of a number of low-cost charter companies that had been competing for customers in Europe. In the last 10 years, there had been a rapid expansion of budget airlines throughout this part of the world. Offering inexpensive, no-frills service, they fought for a piece of the holiday market. Seaside resorts like Sharm El Sheikh were one of the many destinations they serve. Now, one of the ways in which they provide this extremely cheap travel is by operating their aeroplanes 24 hours a day. Operating on such tight schedules means the planes are flown constantly. 
Former Flash passengers step forward to complain about other flights. There are a lot of stories. I was flying home after a vacation. A year before the crash, while flying from Sharm El Sheikh to Bologna, one passenger recalls seeing flames pouring from a Flash Airlines jet. Hey, hey, the engine's on fire. Look. <laughs> Please. The flaming aircraft is forced to make an emergency landing. Investigators learned that in 2002, the Swiss Aviation Authority performed a surprise inspection on the same plane that would later crash. The pilot's oxygen masks are missing. There aren't enough oxygen tanks. Some of the cockpit instruments aren't working. It's enough for the Swiss to ground the flight for eight hours until the company repairs the plane. A few days later, Flash Airlines was banned from flying in Switzerland. Another ban occurred in Poland. In Norway, tour operators stopped contracting with Flash. It's a rare event for an airline to be banned from operating into a country. They had to have done something dramatically wrong, especially when it comes to safety. With mounting concerns about the safety record of Flash Airlines, investigators combed through the company's paperwork they discover that the most recent maintenance records for the plane that crashed were never duplicated. They've gone missing with the aircraft. The lack of having copies of the technical log and all of them being on board, of course, this is a violation. And the civil aviation here issued uh, very uh, clear uh, instructions that this should not happen. The French authorities agree that there are serious questions about Flash. They now ban the company from flying in France. While there are concerns about the state of the company's planes, there are no such issues when it comes to the crew of Flight 604. Captain Kader was considered not only a flying ace, but a national war hero for his performance in the Yom Kippur War. During his career, he not only flew sophisticated fighter jets, but also a variety of large cargo aircraft. He had over 7,000 hours of flying experience, as well as 2,000 hours as a flight instructor. All the evidence shows that Captain Kader was a model pilot. With the aircraft and its black box data recorders still hidden deep under the Red Sea, Investigators wonder, was this a case of a superb pilot fighting to save a decrepit plane? See what the aircraft did? On a moonless January night, a Flash Airlines 737 spiraled wildly into the Red Sea. All 148 people on board were killed. Investigators trying to find out why the plane went down have uncovered a history of safety problems with the airline. But trying to prove that there was anything wrong with the plane that crashed is difficult. Much of the wreckage has sunk deep beneath the waves. Investigators have been unable to find the flight's black boxes. Whenever an airplane crashes into the water, there's always a fear by investigators that the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder may not be recovered. Those two boxes in and of themselves give the investigator a very good picture and without them could make the investigation process very, very difficult. Finally, after several days of searching, a breakthrough. A French research ship hears the locator signals given off by the black boxes. A remotely operated sub drops down over 1,000 meters. The violence of the crash has spread the wreckage over a wide area. Two weeks after the crash, both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder are recovered from the bottom of the sea. 
Investigators finally have some hard evidence. The Egyptian, French and American team examines the critical devices in Cairo. After the two black boxes are found, the salvage effort wraps up. Other than a select number of small pieces, the rest of the plane is too deep to recover. The cost to continue would be too great. Without the wreckage itself, investigators concentrate on what they do have. They hope the black boxes will recreate the final minutes of the doomed plane. One of the things we did to depict the path of the aircraft was we created an animation based on the data we got from the flight data recorder and from radar. The flight data recorder paints a devastating picture. Shortly after takeoff, the plane began heading left, just as it was supposed to. But then it quickly started banking in the other direction. The cockpit voice recorder shows that the turn caught the captain off guard. Turning right, sir. What? How turning right? Analyzing the cockpit voice recorder, it showed that the pilots were experiencing definitely some kind of an abnormality, a problem that they could not understand. The investigators sift through the flight data to find some explanation for the jet's bizarre movement. Perhaps some mechanical fault was forcing the plane off course. And there is an indication that something was wrong with the flash jet before it took off. On the runway, the captain and the ground engineer discussed an electrical malfunction. But it's impossible to tell from the cockpit voice recorder exactly what the problem was. Especially electrical. On n'a pas de certitude sur le dispositif. We can't be sure which equipment was being referred to by the aircraft captain and the engineer when they were discussing faulty equipment. Not enough parts were brought up from the bottom of the sea to be able to determine that. Pour pouvoir dire. And tragically, the ground engineer was also on the flight. We believe from the data we, we are looking at in the flight data recorder that there is a very high possibility that the plane was tending to turn to the right by itself. But what exactly had gone wrong? A thorough accident investigation can take years. But in the case of Flash Flight 604, there are unique challenges. The problem with accident investigation is that it's very time consuming and resource intensive, especially when we don't have an airplane to physically look at. You want to be absolutely sure of the facts, conditions, and circumstances before you publish that information. Family and friends of the victims are becoming more and more frustrated. As the months pass, they demand answers. We were led to protest outside the Egyptian embassy because we had no news. Eleven months after the disaster, we had no message, no information. Shortly after the protest, Egyptian investigators release a factual report. It contains all of the information from the black boxes, but the report does not reach any conclusions about why the jet crashed. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. With a situation as complicated as this one, the investigators don't yet have any answers. The only thing they can do is to keep looking. Investigators discuss several possible scenarios that could have been responsible for the plane's erratic course. You look into every hypothetical scenario that would create 
a similar profile. And then you see if this profile fit the data that you have put together. 50 different theories are examined in minute detail. In the process of looking into all the possible hypothetical scenarios, we proceeded by eliminating those that did not fit the data. Investigators travel to the United States to test the most likely ideas in a sophisticated simulator. If they can force the simulator to repeat the movements of the flash jet, they might be able to figure out why the plane crashed. The results are brought back to Cairo. There are only four mechanical faults that could have produced the flight path of the doomed jet. Investigators believe the key to the crash is to find out why the plane began turning off course. These four scenarios were all related to what would cause an uncommanded bank. So we were left with these as causes that we could not rule out. Two of the scenarios involved the spoilers on the plane's right wing. Spoilers lift up from the top surface of the wing, slowing it down. By producing drag or spoiling the airflow, they help turn the aircraft. If the pilot's control wheel or the cables that connect it to the spoiler jammed, it could have forced the plane off course. Problems with the spoilers are one explanation, but there's no physical proof. And while there were maintenance problems with flash planes, none of them had to do with the jet spoilers. The team searches for another explanation. Another potential cause of the crash is the plane's ailerons. This part of a plane's wing controls the angle of a plane's turn. A malfunctioning aileron could have caused the plane to roll to the right. Again, if the crew couldn't fix the problem, the plane would have begun to spiral into the sea. While so-called aileron trim runaway would create a flight path like the one seen during the crash, once again, there's no physical proof to support the theory. And typically, aileron trim runaway can be physically overcome by pilots. All he would have had to do was overpower using more force to move the control wheel in an opposite direction. Overbank. When they listen to the Auto cockpit pilot. voice recorder, the investigators are puzzled Auto by the constant discussion of the Auto plane's pilot. autopilot. Autopilot. The captain asked for the autopilot to be turned on, but it had no effect and the plane began to plummet to the sea. And earlier in the cockpit recording, investigators uncover another curious exchange. Captain Kader began the initial turn over the Red Sea manually, but decided to let the autopilot take over. Autopilot. The flight data recorder shows that the autopilot was indeed turned on as the plane climbed. Not yet. But then the captain appears to change his mind. The plane's flight data recorder shows that the autopilot was only activated for three seconds. But investigators wonder if the autopilot had malfunctioned and stayed in command of the jet. The automated system could have continued to control the plane, flying it to the right, even after the pilots thought it had been disengaged. The malfunction of the autopilot, of course, took a lot of work from us because it was nearly impossible to show that it did not happen and quite impossible to show that it did happen. So, but it was always a very prominent possibility because it would give a very, very close scenario to what was happening. Perhaps most puzzling of all, though, is that no matter what happened to the plane, 
It appeared to be under control just before it crashed. Moments before impact, the captain was seemingly back in command of his airplane. If there had been some crippling mechanical problem, why did it seem to disappear? Some members of the team want to consider something besides mechanical fault. The pilots themselves. I think the major concern for the United States was that the human factors elements of this accident weren't thoroughly explored. Perhaps the high esteem given to Egyptian pilots was getting in the way. In Egypt, pilots are very respected. And in particular, Air Force pilots are very highly regarded. For the past 26 years, the country's president has been a highly decorated Air Force officer. And in an environment like this, the pilot is somewhat immune to suspicion. When something goes wrong, the natural tendency is to blame the equipment. And on this flight, the pilot was a war hero with thousands of hours of experience. Studying the flight data recorders again, the investigators discover something peculiar. Even before the plane's bizarre turn to the right, three things all seem to happen at the same time. Instead of a smooth left turn, the plane begins to come out of its turn early. The nose starts to rise, and the plane's airspeed decreases noticeably. But during this time, the pilot says nothing. It seems that he's unaware of the changes to his flight path. I've flown out of Charmoche at night time and in the same type of aircraft. And in no way should the pilot allow the airspeed to drop by as much as 30 knots, or the bank angle to change beyond five degrees without clearly stating the reasons for the change in the flight path. Some investigators consider a provocative theory that might explain this seemingly bizarre behavior. Perhaps Captain Kader had been affected by vertigo. Vertigo is a physiological condition that would exist with any person, not just pilots. And it's based on the inner ear, over a dark ocean without a defined visual horizon, no ground lights. The pilot may not be able to perceive visually whether he was flying up, down, left, or right. And if the fluid in his inner ear was moving or he tilted his head, that may induce a sensation, a physiological sensation, that may cause the pilot to believe the airplane is flying straight and level when it's actually turning. The plane's flight path is ideal for creating a sense of vertigo. The flash airline jet took off into a moonless night. Captain Kader was flying manually and began to turn as he was climbing. Heading out over dark water, it would be very difficult using just his senses for Captain Kader to know exactly where he was. Roger, when ready, inshallah. Left turn to establish 306, Sharm VOR. It is actually a very high workload situation. And when there are no visual cues outside because it's a moonless night and you're over featureless territory with no lights in it, you really, as a professional pilot, should be totally aware of the fact that this is a situation in which you could get disorientated. It's a classic. It's happened so many times. It's killed so many people in the last 10 years. When the plane was supposed to be turning slowly left, the control wheel began inching towards the right. Perhaps the captain was making the turn without even being aware of it. When you study the movement of the aircraft control surfaces, it appears that something was guiding Captain Cutter to the right. Now, that could have been a false horizon or something he's seen outside of his window. See what the aircraft just did? Or perhaps he believed he was actually correcting a problem with the plane itself. He thinks he's gained his flight path again. And all of a sudden, at this moment, he receives contradictory information. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. The contradictory information adds to the pilot's confusion. He believes he's fixing a problem when he's told his problems have just started. 
in this particular instance, not only are you trying to fly the airplane and understand situationally what's happening, but you're going through the mental gymnastics because your expectations are one way. Meanwhile, you have a first officer who's telling him something that's totally different. Aircraft is turning right. Egyptian investigators agree that Captain Kader may have suffered some form of disorientation during the flight. But they don't believe it was the only problem the crew was dealing with. I don't really have a very clear indication that there was disorientation, but it's possible. There was a recovery from disorientation. The time to find out the problem and take the corrective action needed was more than the time left before impact. No matter what role disorientation played in the crash, investigators are about to learn that the crew wasn't properly trained to deal with it. Flash Airlines never provided the pilots with basic information that could have saved their lives. It's been two years since an Egyptian charter plane smashed into the Red Sea. 148 people were killed. Investigators trying to figure out why Flash Airlines Flight 604 crashed face immense challenges. Most of the wreck is still deep underwater. By carefully examining the plane's black boxes, the investigators believe that disorientation may have played a role in the accident. The pitch black night and the featureless sea caused the pilot to become confused about what was happening. But mechanical problems may also have plagued the plane. As they continue to try to solve the mystery, investigators make a startling discovery. Officials at Flash Airlines reveal that they hadn't provided the pilots with crew resource management training, although it was a requirement for the company. It might have helped the crew deal with their horrifying situation. Crew resource management is a program where pilots are trained to work together rather than as individuals. Had the pilots of Flash Air 604 received a formal CRM training program, the outcome of this flight may have been substantially different. American investigators believe the very junior first officer may have felt the plane was in trouble before the captain did, but failed to offer suggestions to his much more experienced co-worker. Right. Nor did he attempt to take control of the plane. Formal CRM training would have empowered the first officer who had the best situational awareness and the most information about the position of the airplane to take command of the airplane when he saw that the captain wasn't taking the appropriate corrective action. An earlier conversation in the cockpit before takeoff may reveal why the young first officer would have been reluctant to challenge the captain. Yesterday, we were coming in at dusk and the sun was 2-2. Two -two. I felt I could hardly see the runway. He's already saying, in sight. <laughs> what in sight? Aid, sir. It may not have meant to be insulting, but it may have reinforced the first officer's feeling that he was the student and the captain was the teacher. I am unable to raise my eyes, and he says, in sight. <laughs> Where in sight? <laughs> it is going to serve as negative feedback. The young first officer is bound to hesitate. He doesn't want to be wrong again. He doesn't want to lose the respect of an Air Force general. In a crew, an effort must be made to bring together people who are able to co-pilot, not a crew in which one person pilots and the other person looks on without saying a word. But the captain and the co-pilot weren't alone in the cockpit. A third crew member with more experience than the first officer was also there. Maybe he's scattered. He too never said anything until the final seconds of the flight. Otherwise. How will we know when we clear the cloud? We hear him speak very clearly and very openly all during the time before the engine startup. He was in conversation with the first officer and with the captain. So this experienced person 
being very quiet all through. We believe that he, if he saw any of the crew members doing something that he should not be doing, or uh, not doing something that he should be doing, would have said something. Retard power! Retard power! The only word he said was, retard the throttles at the later stage of the event. Shows that the, that's, that's the only thing he saw that should be done. Even if the co-pilot had taken control sooner, there's no way to know if he could have saved the jet. Whatever took place on Flight 604 happened quickly. And since the plane had just taken off, the crew had little time to react before they crashed into the sea. The final report on the Flash Airlines crash was released in March 2006. There are no clear answers. Egyptian officials say that any of four mechanical problems could have caused the crash. They say disorientation may have played a role, but it's not the reason behind the accident. American investigators refuse to blame the plane. Instead, they say the problem lies with the airline, which didn't sufficiently train their crews. The pilots are responding based on skills, abilities, knowledge, and what they got out of training. If the training was deficient, that's a company responsibility. Two months after the crash, Flash Airlines went out of business. And as a result of the Flash 604 tragedy, new rules came into place to ensure that in the future, aircraft safety violations will be judged more harshly. The Flash Airlines crash gave the final political impetus to a move to create a European blacklist where if one state banned an airline, then all the other Euro Euro European Union states would automatically ban that airline also. The Egyptian investigation concluded with an important recommendation. We have recommended that some kind of training or uh, awareness program should be made to be able to have a pilot observe another being disoriented early and what he should do to first maintain a safe flight, second to pull the, pull the pilot from his disorientation back to orientation. Was there a mechanical problem at the heart of the crash? Investigators will likely never know. With so much of the plane still at the bottom of the Red Sea, questions will always remain for investigators and everyone else who was affected by the crash. I lost my nephews and my niece. They were just kids. What future would they have had? How can you put a price on that? What a waste. The families will never be able to fully mourn, me included, because we'll never know what's really happened. Wednesday, April the 3rd, 1996. A raw spring day near the city of Dubrovnik, Croatia. Rain pelts the runway at the city's airport. A small group of diplomats hurry through the storm, trying to keep dry. They're part of a delegation that's just touched down. Among them, the Croatian Prime Minister and the American ambassador to the region, Peter Galbraith. The flight into Dubrovnik was a scary flight. We couldn't see anything at all. At that point, I'd been ambassador to Croatia for nearly three years, and I'd done a, a, a lot of shuttle diplomacy, and it certainly was one of the most uncomfortable. The weather that made Galbraith's landing so bad 
isn't letting up. In fact, commercial flights into Dubrovnik have been cancelled. But the ambassador and the others aren't waiting for a commercial flight. They're here to greet IFO-21, a US Air Force jet on a delicate mission. The plane is a specially designed 737. The Air Force has a small fleet of these jets to transport high-profile guests around the world. The cabin has everything needed to do business and politics 10,000 meters in the sky. Today, the cabin is filled with what the military call DVs, distinguished visitors. This group is led by United States Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown. Ron Brown was a very smooth, capable individual. He was a, a Washington insider, uh, and he had all the skills that, that go with that. Brown is a star in the Democratic Party. I obviously will do everything that is possible. He played an important role in getting Bill Clinton elected president. Under Clinton, Brown was appointed the first African-American Commerce Secretary in the country's history. The United States companies that are here today are eager to engage in dialogue with government and business leaders and, more importantly, to do business. Today, that job has taken Brown to one of the most troubled areas in the world. For four years, civil war ripped Bosnia and Croatia apart. But just a few months ago, an uneasy peace began. As Commerce Secretary, Brown is helping to rebuild the local economy. The philosophy behind it was that uh, the peace would not be durable unless there was economic progress in the region, that that was really critical to the peace. Brown's three-day tour started that morning in Tuzla, Bosnia, where the group toured an electrical plant and ate hamburgers with American troops stationed there. Being a former army man myself, I know what being away from home uh, is like, so we thought we would bring a little bit of home to you. The final stop on today's tour is the ancient coastal city of Dubrovnik. Before the war, it was a vital part of the country's tourism industry. It was my idea that Ron Brown should go to Dubrovnik. The Croatians were very eager to get the word out that Dubrovnik was still standing and that it was still a tourist destination. So I thought it would be very useful to have uh, Ron Brown and the delegation go there. But on this damp day, Dubrovnik is not at its best, or even visible. Fog presses down from the sky, obscuring the city and the beautiful Adriatic coast. To the north of Dubrovnik flies IFO-21. Its pilot is Captain Ashley J. Davis. His colleagues call him AJ. Departure, IFO-21. IFO 21. From the cockpit, Davis can see some clouds ahead that he wants to avoid. I'm left here just a couple of miles for a build up. IFO 21, this is approved as requested. Uh, climb and maintain fly level 160. Up to 160 now. IFO 21. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. AJ Davis and his crew have been on the go since dawn. While the cabin of this plane is built for comfort, the cockpit is virtually identical to a standard issue 737. A.J. Davis grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and dreamed of being a pilot. He made it and has been on the front line of American military efforts. In the past, he flew mid-air refuelers high above the Persian Gulf. But now he pilots diplomats and other officials from around the world. It means a lot of traveling and a lot of time away from his wife and two children at Ramstein, an American base in Germany. According to the Air Force ranks, Shelley Kelly is a technical sergeant. 
Today on IFO 21, her main job is to make sure the passengers have everything they need. Mr. Secretary, something to eat. No, no, thank you. I was wondering how our time's looking. The diplomats are expecting to arrive in Dubrovnik by mid-afternoon. But they've been running late all day. I can check to find out for sure if you'd like. Yeah, thank you. Early would be good. <laughs> As the plane nears Dubrovnik, A.J. Davis calls the United States Air Force Weather Service for an update. Metro, IFO 21, how copy? Over. IFO 21, copy loud and clear. Weather for Lima Delta uniform as follows. Rain. Sky conditions 500, broken. That would be ceiling. How well do you copy? Metro, IFO 21, copies. Yeah, we've been in it all day. Are you expecting any uh, changes in the weather? Pretty much continued rain, over. Copy, rain. Thanks for your help. So, let's see the sights of Dubrovnik. Only four months after a peace treaty was signed, the skies over this part of the world aren't guaranteed to be friendly. Planes are still required to fly in certain highly restricted lanes. While he's aware that there are flight restrictions, Davis has never flown in this part of the world before. As he nears the Croatian border, he gets an unexpected warning. IFO 21, this is Magic 51. Magic is the call sign for the peacekeeping airborne early warning aircraft that watches air corridors like a traffic cop. Be advised, you're leaving an approved corridor. Please reroute immediately. Davis isn't off course. He's flying the exact route he had planned. But without knowing it, Davis and his plane are flying out of approved airspace. They're flying into potentially dangerous Repeat, territory. We're leaving an approved corridor. Reroute. Roger, magic. Our error. Rerouting now to proper corridor. Over. The second time today. The approved corridors do change, and Davis and his crew should have been informed. To stay on an approved course, Davis will have to swing out to the west. It's an embarrassing situation that's going to cost them time. Shelley, AJ, we've been directed to reroute. We'll be arriving about 15 minutes late at Dubrovnik. Apologies to all back there. Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention, please? Unfortunately, there will be a slight delay on our arrival into Dubrovnik. <sighs> DVs aren't going to be happy at all. The weather ahead will probably slow us down even more. Outside his plane, the heavy rain continues to crash down. Flying toward an unfamiliar airport with a cabin full of businessmen and diplomats, Davis has a difficult task ahead. What happens to this plane and its passengers over the next several hours will capture the attention of the world. A heavy rain soaks a small airport in Dubrovnik, Croatia. Headed towards it is a U.S. Air Force 737 carrying 35 people on a trade mission. Leading the delegation, U.S. Secretary of Commerce Ron Brown. We'll see which path ambassador takes me. Dubrovnik approach, IFO 21, level 100. Dubrovnik approach, good afternoon. Maintain 10,000 feet for beacon approach. Runway 12. Okay, descending to 10,000 feet, IFO 21. The weather is so bad today that commercial flights have been cancelled. As they approach the airport, the rain isn't letting up. But the crew is dealing with more than just bad weather. The recent civil war has taken a heavy toll on Dubrovnik's airport. It had been closed for several years and is waiting for a new landing system. 
the airport was totally trashed by the Serbs who had taken over the airport during the 91 war. And they really went out of their way to, to, for the destruction. They destroyed the instrument landing system. The new one was on order. Around the world, airports use sophisticated technology to help planes take off and land. Doppler radar warns of incoming storms. Glide slopes help pilots stay on course to land. The devastated Dubrovnik airport has none of that. It doesn't even have radar to see the planes that are coming in for landing. Instead, the airport is using so-called non-directional beacons to guide planes towards the runway. In the aviation world, it's ancient technology. There are many non-directional beacons used in the United States and throughout the world, but they're an older navigational aid. Uh, and in fact, uh, they were on the way out. The system in Dubrovnik has two beacons on the ground, which send out signals to the plane. When the crew receives the signals, they consult their charts and follow the course that will take them to the airport. The crew of IFO-21 is still waiting to hear the first signal when they get a call from the ground. 9A uh, CRO to IFO-21. IFO-21, I read you, 9A CRO, over. Another plane, this one carrying Ambassador Galbraith, had touched down earlier in Dubrovnik. The pilot of that plane is an experienced flyer who's very familiar with the area. He wants to let the crew know what to expect. Uh, IFO 21, uh, we landed about an hour ago. Um, the weather was at minimum. Adjusting the wording to split if you have to execute the missed approach. Over. Roger, 9ACRO, we read you. Out. Diverting wouldn't be welcome news for the members of the trade delegation. The pressures to get the passengers to scheduled news conferences and other activities were probably pretty high. As Davis closes in on the airport, the Dubrovnik Tower calls again. IFO 21, report level. IFO 21, 5,000. IFO 21, Roger. Descend to 4,000. Report Kilo Lima Papa. Down to 4,000, IFO 21. Flying above the storm, the crew finally hears the radio signal from the first beacon. Hey, Age. At Kilo Lima Papa, we're tracking outbound at 119 degrees. 119 confirmed. Mr. Secretary, we're landing. We'll take this up later, Adam. It's not very broken up down there. I can't see through it. Tim? The clouds are thick. The crew can't see the ground. They have to trust their instruments as they descend through the storm. IFO 21. Sir, we are inside the locator, inbound. IFO 21, Roger. Cleared for beacon approach. Runway is what? IFO 21. J. Davis flies blind through heavy rain and cloud cover. He expects to see the airport any second.
5021, do you read? Just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Dubrovnik Tower loses all contact with IFO 21. IFO 21, Dubrovnik approach, do you read? I-421, do you read? Without approach radar to track the plane, controllers have no idea where it is. Perhaps the plane has diverted to another airport. I-421, do you read? But as the minutes stretch on with no word from the American plane, local controllers are taking no chances. Initiate emergency procures. Near the end of our shift, we heard about the possibility of a missing plane. We didn't know who was on the plane. We had no details about the flight. For situations like this, there is a certain procedure, and we just waited for more information. Peter Galbraith is waiting at the airport with Croatia's prime minister. It was clear from my own flight in that it, this was a very marginal landing. I did not expect them to attempt the landing in Dubrovnik. The Croatian prime minister came up to me and pulled me aside. He said, we've lost radio contact with Ron Brown's plane. I got the State Department Operations Center on the phone and he's asked to activate the U.S. military to start uh, search and rescue uh, activities. Word goes out to the chain of air traffic control centers. But no one has had any contact with IFO 21. The search and rescue effort focuses on the approach to the airport. Perhaps the plane had ditched into the Adriatic, At the time, I was about 100 miles away. I was in Brindisi, Italy. We launched two of our MH-53 helicopters with special tactics Air Force personnel on board, headed to Dubrovnik. For hours, there is no sign of the missing aircraft. The weather conditions are getting worse. Fog was in, uh, thunderstorms in the area, low visibility. IFO 21, Dubrovnik approach, do you read? IFO 21 has a CPI, or crash position indicator, on board. IFO 21, do you read? If the plane went down, the CPI should be sending out an ultra-high frequency signal. IFO 21, but the Dubrovnik airport, as well as lacking radar, does not have the equipment to pick up the signal. IFO 21, Dubrovnik approach, do you read? I-421, do you read? I-421, do you read? As the hours pass, poor visibility frustrates the searchers. They arrived off the coast, and they were over water looking for the crash. Hours after the plane disappears, police respond to a tip. A local villager has seen something on the hill above his house. It's a long way from the coast where the search is concentrated. We went up with two vehicles to check the mountains. The weather was extremely horrible, strong rain and thick fog. So we went on foot for about an hour up that mountain. Then we came close. It's almost 7.30 at night, four and a half hours after the crew called for clearance to land. The crash of IFO 21 is finally confirmed. The news races from Dubrovnik to America. The crash site has been reached by Croatian police, and I have uh, I've just received word that there's also a Croatian doctor on the scene. The tail section is the only substantial piece of IFO 21 that's left. Debris and bodies are scattered across the mountain. These were hard moments. 
as we were walking over the boulders, not knowing if we're going to step on someone's body. These are the moments that you can't forget. Then, almost miraculously, police make a heartening discovery. Inside the tail section, they find a survivor. It's technical sergeant Shelley Kelly. As we arrived at the tail section, one policeman went inside and found the body of a stewardess, and he tried to help. That was our hope. We wanted to help. We wanted to save every life, and hers was our chance. We were counting on it. In the darkness, they realize that Kelly needs immediate medical attention if she's going to survive. When I realized that there was no one to help, I radioed the police central station in Dubrovnik and got them the location of the crash site. By then, it was completely dark. St. John's Hill is alive with close to 100 Croatian policemen and military. American forces are also rushing to the scene. Enormous rocks and treacherous conditions make the wreck site difficult to reach. But there are also remnants of the recent war. Mike Canavan is in charge of the US crash recovery operation. I met a Croatian major. He told me that he was gonna be the guide that would take us up to the top of the mountain. And at that time, he happened to mention that there were several minefields between where we were and the crash site. It takes almost two hours for Canavan to finally make it up the rocky hill. We had been walking for some time, and it was very dark. And all of a sudden, I saw something that was darker, and I didn't know what it was. And I reached out, and it was an aircraft engine. On top of the hill, the weather is making it impossible for helicopters to land. Emergency workers can't wait for the weather to clear. They have to get Technical Sergeant Kelly off the mountain immediately. She has a broken spine and other severe injuries. But if she can be kept alive, rescuers hope she can shed some light on what went wrong. With Kelly off the mountain, the search for other survivors continues. Finally, in the darkness, rescue workers find the body of Ron Brown, the US Commerce Secretary. In fact, as rescuers continue to comb the hillside, all they find are bodies. A.J. Davis and the rest of the crew were probably killed instantly. All the other members of the trade delegation are also killed. As dozens of emergency workers continue their grim search, a call comes from Dubrovnik. Technical Sergeant Shelley Kelly is pronounced dead in the ambulance en route to hospital. No one has survived the crash of IFO 21. A grim spring rain hammers down on the mountains of Croatia. Near the Dubrovnik airport, a 737 has crashed. The jet was an American Air Force's plane on a trade mission through the region. Police and members of the military have searched for survivors, but all 35 people who were on the flight are now dead. Including the American Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown. In the darkness, the rescuers begin a very different job. Mike Canavan is with the US Special Forces. Once uh, we realized there were no survivors, 
the mission changes. It goes to, there's no one to rescue. Now you have to recover remains. By dawn, the weather has improved. Peter Galbraith gets his first glimpse of the crash site. We walked up the mountain. The weather was somewhat better. And near the top, uh, there was the uh, fuselage of the plane, rear part of it, and debris all over the place. And then on the other side of the ridge were the bodies. There's nothing in the world that compares to a plane crash. The one thing that my folks did on the mountain and then down in Dubrovnik is they did this with dignity and respect. And I thought it was done exceptionally well. Ladies and gentlemen, the vice president and the first lady and the members of cabinet and I wanted to come here to be with the employees of the Commerce Department at this very difficult hour. Hillary and I have just come from Ron Brown's home visiting with Alma and Michael and their family and friends who are there. As the truth sets in, the hard questions begin. How had a specially redesigned US Air Force 737 crashed on a hillside in Croatia. Was it simply bad weather? Or in a war-ravaged part of the world, was there another cause? Purpose of the accident investigation team, I can guarantee you that they will be extremely thorough in their analysis in trying to determine the causes of this accident. Because of the high-profile nature of the passengers, Rumors begin swirling immediately. Howard Swansea is one of dozens of experts assigned to the team. In every accident, there's always a lot of speculation. In this particular case, you had a high-ranking US government official. Uh, and so by the time we had even got to the crash site, uh, there was just quite a bit of media attention around it. And there were fragments, pieces of aircraft miles away from the wreckage. Uh, so my idea was to get as much information or collect as much artifacts or physical evidence as I could. Right from the start, the investigation team is at a disadvantage. They discover that there's no cockpit voice recorder or flight data recorder on the plane. What's standard for passenger jets is not required in the Air Force. I had assumed uh, uh, that, that the Air Force and these VIP flights had higher safety standards than commercial flights. And so I was really shocked to learn that the standards were generally lower than those for commercial aviation. Without the standard tools, investigators can't afford to overlook anything. The wreck is almost three kilometers from the airport. How did a trained crew get so far off course? As Swansea examines the wreckage, Nelson Spornheimer is brought in to look at other evidence. An expert in aerial navigation, he plots the plane's doomed final minutes. To trace the last moments of the flight, he turns to the sky and the US Air Force radar plane, which had been patrolling the region. IFO 21, this is Magic 5 1. Be advised, you're leaving an approved corridor. Please reroute immediately. Rerouting now to proper corridor. Over. Apart from heading out of approved airspace, Spornheimer finds nothing unusual about the plane's flight until the end. The radar track that I was given was from an AWACS aircraft and showed that the en route portions of the flight from about 100 miles prior to the airport were entirely nominal. 
The last segment of the flight, however, beginning 20 kilometers from the airport, is different. On their final approach, the plane begins to head off course. They start flying in a straight line, which heads right into the mountains. My initial look at the flight track of the aircraft uh, showed a, a seven degree bearing error in the final segment of the approach. A small error when traveling at hundreds of kilometers an hour could quickly lead to an enormous problem. But why would the plane get off course at the end of the trip if the rest of the flight showed no major navigational problems? Even in bad weather, how had the crew become so lost? Spornheimer examines the outdated navigational equipment at the airport. Badly damaged during the recent war, perhaps it had malfunctioned. Two separate navigational beacons are used for landing in Dubrovnik. One guides planes to the runway, the other lets them know if they've gone too far. The first is located on nearby Kolosep Island. It transmits a specific Morse code signal to make it easily identifiable. When they hear it, all Davis and his crew need to do is fly a heading specified on their landing charts. If they do, they should eventually arrive at the airport. The second beacon is located at the airport itself. It's a fail-safe device. If the crew hears the beacon before they see the airport, they have to declare a missed approach and circle around to try landing again. In fact, the plane that brought Peter Galbraith to Dubrovnik just minutes before IFO-21 only landed on its second attempt. IFO-21, I read you, 9ACRO, over. Just in the verdict to split if you have to execute the missed approach. Over. Roger, 9ACRO, we read you. Out. But after studying the equipment, Spornheimer doesn't believe it played a role in the crash. Both the non-directional beacons were found to be operating normally by flight tests within a few days after the accident. There are bizarre rumors of an even more sinister theory. Perhaps Davis was following a decoy beacon put in the mountains on purpose. In a troubled region, was this an attack on the trade mission? get a signal that is strong enough to be heard, you have to have a very large ground system, which is difficult to establish in rocky, sandy soil. So it would be very expensive and very time consuming to, to set up an NDB in the mountains. Such an elaborate scheme would be nearly impossible to pull off. No evidence is ever found of a decoy beacon. The investigation continues. In the wreckage of the Air Force flight, investigators discover an important piece of the puzzle. The plane's ADF, or Automatic Direction Finder, is recovered. It appears to be working, but only one of the units had been installed on this jet. To perform a proper landing in Dubrovnik, a plane requires two ADFs. The device listens to the signals put out by the land-based beacons, but it can only listen to one at a time. We're still not past it. I'm tuning back to KLP. Flying with one ADF, the crew can listen to either the beacon which is telling them how to get to the airport, or the beacon which is telling them they've gone too far. They can't do both at the same time. That would have required two ADF receivers in the aircraft, which the accident aircraft had only one. And only having one ADF restricted their ability to follow the approach accurately. I got CV. We're still not past it. I'm tuning back to KLP. By quickly tuning back and forth between the two beacons, the crew can use one ADF to listen to two signals. But it would have added stress to an already difficult landing. And it's another surprise. The Air Force jet wasn't adequately equipped to land at this airport. 
you're talking in a very short time span of making the approach, it's going to become rather difficult in trying to dial both to keep listening to the code if you're also trying to search for your course and headings. As he continues to study the path that IFO 21 took, Nelson Spornheimer focuses on an S-shaped curve in the plane's flight. It's the sort of path a plane would take when looking for a signal from a non-directional beacon. But just when the crew should be looking for the beacon signal, the S-turns disappear. At about uh, two or three miles inside the final approach fix for the next seven or eight, nine miles, the flight track is perfectly straight. Instead of trusting the navigational system that was in place, even though it was primitive, the crew suddenly seems to give up. And Spornheimer thinks he knows why. Fighting heavy rain and hampered by a single direction finder, Spornheimer believes the crew resorted to another, even older piece of technology to find the runway, something called INS, or Inertial Navigation System. An INS system uses gyroscopes to maintain an awareness of how much the airplane turns and banks. After entering a specific geographical position at the beginning of a flight, an inertial navigation system tracks all the turns a plane makes. It's a self-contained system on the aircraft. But there is a potentially enormous problem. If the gyroscopes don't perfectly calculate every single maneuver of the plane, a pilot can be off course. It's not very broken up down there. I can't see through it. Tim? The crew might have thought that switching to this system would help them find their way. But in this case, it might have put the plane dangerously off course. INS drift in this case was probably in my view, the primary reason the aircraft ended up where it was. Investigator Howard Swansea examines the Jepson approach chart the crew was using as they attempted to land. Hampered by poor visibility and relying on the inertial navigation system, their charts would have been a key aid. But when he takes a closer look at it, he notices something peculiar. A key figure, the minimum descent altitude, isn't accurate. The minimum descent altitude is the height where pilots must be able to see the airport. If you can't see it at that height, you have to abort the landing. Each country uh, um, has the responsibility of developing these procedures and then publishing information so that the other nationalities as well as their own air crews can fly those approach positions. Swansea discovers that the minimum descent altitude on the chart doesn't meet American aviation standards. Given the mountainous terrain, it should have been more than 2,800 feet. But the chart the crew was using said it was just over 2,100 feet. It means that the crew could have flown almost 700 feet lower than experts in the US thought was safe without having to abort the landing. Combined with the other problems the crew was dealing with, the non-standard chart sealed their fate. Struggling to find the airport, they were straining to see through the clouds, assuming they were still safely above the mountains. But why wasn't an Air Force jet properly equipped to land in Dubrovnik? And why didn't the crew have the right landing charts that would have made even a difficult flight safer? The answers are found at an American military base in Germany, with some of the most senior members of the Air Force. In the spring of 1996, 
A US Air Force jet crashed just outside the airport in Dubrovnik, Croatia. None of the 35 people on board IFO-21 survived. The plane was a specially redesigned 737, but the investigators have found that the crew didn't have the equipment it needed to safely land in the war-ravaged airport, and that the charts they were using weren't up to American aviation standards. To discover why the crew were attempting to land in such difficult circumstances, the investigators question Colonel John Mazarowski. He's the operations group commander for the airlift wing in charge of the flight. His job is to provide transportation for a growing number of distinguished visitors. But these are tight budget times. Mazarowski has been told to do more with less. What I'd like to talk about now is the Jefferson approach subject. One of the major focuses of the investigators is the Jepson landing charts the crew were using. The charts, drawn up for most major airports, give crews a vast amount of information, including what to do in the case of a missed approach. But investigator Howard Swansea has already found that these charts were not up to US standards. The Air Force had a directive that required um, all procedures in foreign countries to have gone through a U.S. or their evaluation process prior to an Air Force crew being able to fly that approach. Landing at the Dubrovnik airport had not been approved. The Jepson landing charts that did exist for the airport had not been reviewed. It's the reason that Howard Swansea found a difference between what the charts said and what was considered safe by the Defense Department. Mazarowski believed that restricting his planes to approved airports would severely limit some of his missions. It takes time to check all the airports out. He had asked for the review to be waived for some airports, including Dubrovnik. This Jefferson approach waiver, what caused you to initiate this? It just seemed like uh, we had been using these approaches for years. Uh, safety didn't seem to be in question. But the Defense Department waiver was never granted. The approach for Dubrovnik was never approved. Yet even without the safety clearance, the Air Force continued to land there. IFO 2-1, level one zero, zero. Dubrovnik approach, good afternoon. The airport in Dubrovnik was far below modern standards. The charts used to land there hadn't been checked by the Department of Defense. Nevertheless, senior Air Force officials had decided to permit landing at Dubrovnik and other airports they were flying into. In fact, none of them have been approved in this time frame. Not to my knowledge, sir. No. In the end, a fatal combination of factors had come together to cause the crash of IFO-21. Dubrovnik approach, IFO-21, level 100. Dubrovnik approach, good afternoon. Maintain 10,000 feet for beacon approach. Runway 12. IFO-21. The crew were fighting bad weather. They were landing in an unfamiliar airport, which was hobbled by old technology. The unapproved charts made a bad situation much worse. After an investigation involving nearly 150 interviews, the final report on the crash of IFO-21 exceeds 7,000 pages. How much of the weeping we have done this last week because there were so many brilliant young people 
on that plane with him from different backgrounds and different racial groups. Why? Because Ron Brown could see in them the promise of a new tomorrow. The results of the investigation fault several individuals and institutions. Dubrovnik Airport is singled out for an improperly designed instrument approach procedure. Today, automatic direction finders are no longer needed to land at Dubrovnik. The airport has replaced its approach equipment with the instrument landing system which was being delivered at the time of the accident. I got CV. The final report says AJ Davis and his cockpit crew are responsible for flight errors. And like a bullet piercing the heart of Air Force operations, leading military figures are blamed for a failure of command. In the aftermath of the report, two senior members of the Air Force are relieved of their posts. The Air Force severely reprimands Colonel John Mazurowski for dereliction of duty. He is demoted and eventually retires as a major. Thirteen other officers are also singled out for their roles in connection with the crash. The Air Force also changed the way it did business. All military aircraft were ordered to carry flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorders. No aircraft is allowed to fly into an airport without approval from the Department of Defense, not even for high-ranking diplomats. IFO-21. Sir, we are inside the locator, inbound. IFO-21, roger. Cleared for beacon approach. Runway is wet. IFO-21. The Air Force Command was held accountable for the accident. But it's the pilots, the crew, and the passengers of IFO-21 who paid the ultimate price for oversights made by the 86th Airlift Command. Nimitz Hill, Guam. Once the site of fierce American offensives during World War II, for over 50 years, there's been peace here. Now the hill is peaceful, invaded by hunters. And the normal quiet is broken by the roar of jumbo jets as they fly overhead. Every night, commercial pilots must fly over this tall, rocky outcrop and land at Guam's Aganya International Airport. Flights come from airports all across Asia. Just past midnight, on August the 6th, 1997, Korean Airlines Flight 801 is on its way to Guam from Seoul, South Korea. 42-year-old Captain Park Young chol is at the controls. A former Korean Air Force pilot, Park has been flying 747s for more than six years. Just a few months ago, he received a flight safety award from the president of Korean Air for successfully handling a 747 engine failure at low altitude. Park is supposed to be flying to the United Arab Emirates tonight, but a scheduling change has put him in command of this shorter flight to Guam. In the cabin, Korean, Japanese and Western tourists are heading for Guam's pristine beaches. Guam is a US territory run under US law. The island is tiny, fewer than 600 square kilometers, but there's enough sand to keep people coming.
24-year-old Sean Burke and his girlfriend, Wendy Bunton, are planning to make the most of Guam's beaches. They're flying in from San Diego for a vacation. Sean and Wendy were uh, going to Guam to do some scuba diving, reef diving, and, um, and at the same time, they were going to visit her brother, who was in the Navy over there. He was a Navy doctor. Flight 801 is taking Barry Small back to work. He's returning to Guam from New Zealand for another six-month contract as a helicopter pilot. But he does it with a heavy heart. The night before I left, uh, my father had a heart attack. And I had to CPR him until the ambulance arrived and decided to cancel the contract so I could uh, help him. But he was insistent that you must carry on with your job. The flight is still a couple of hours from Guam when the calm evening is brutally interrupted. Watch the speed. It could be severe turbulence. Make an announcement to have everyone in their seats with seatbelts on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first officer speaking. Even an experienced flyer like Barry Small is surprised. There was no lead up to this turbulence again. Anybody that wasn't strapped down was going to be heavy on that's for sure. The lockers were rattling and uh, anything uh, in those lockers was, was bound to break. It was uh, a horrendous shudder. It's heavy turbulence. But the crew ride it out. Eventually, the flight returns to normal. We're through it. Let the passengers know. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first officer speaking. We have cleared the turbulent area. But it's left some of the passengers shaken. It's okay, Rika. We'll be there soon. Ma'am, if you don't mind, I'm gonna move this duty-free up here for you. The cabin crew cleans up. And the passengers settle in for the rest of the trip. Because of the 12-hour stopover in, in Seoul and no change of clothes, um, it was getting rather uncomfortable in a tropical environment, and I took my shoes off just to, to relax a little bit and feel more comfortable. Captain Park and his crew begin looking ahead. They know there's more unsettled weather coming. Rain has been hitting Guam on and off all day. In fact, August is the heart of the island's rainy season. Small showers can pop up, making visibility unpredictable. In that particular part of the world, they have what's called a top hat thunderstorm. That is a very small thunderstorm that builds up all times of the day, and it's very short lived So it wouldn't hamper the pilot's ability to actually conduct the approach. It's gonna just obscure his view for some period of time while they're transiting through it. Just past one in the morning, Korean Air Flight 801 makes initial radio contact with Kurt Mayo, the radar controller at Guam's airport. Guam Center, Korea 801, leaving level 410 for 2600. Korean Air 801, roger. The crew aren't the only ones preparing to land. After more than three hours of flying through the night, the passengers get ready for the airport. I saw the, the lights of Guam and I knew exactly where the aircraft was because I'd been there many times before. Captain Park has navigated Nimitz Hill nine times before, but this time there's a major difference. At airports around the world, pilots land with the help of a glide slope, an electronic system that helps planes safely touch down. If pilots follow the directions given by the glide slope, 
It guides them to the foot of the runway. The glide slope beacon at Guam Airport has been removed for extensive maintenance. Without the airport transmitter, Park's glide slope indicator in the cockpit is useless. Landing without a glide slope is rare, but it does happen. In Guam, the transmitter is scheduled to be out of service for more than two months. But impaired navigation is only part of the problem. Captain Park is fighting exhaustion. They make us classicize work to the maximum. Probably this way, hotel expenses are saved on cabin crews and they maximize flight hours. Really sleepy. Now, as the plane approaches Guam, clouds and rain block their way. Captain, Guam condition is no good. It's raining a lot. It's been several hours since Captain Park and his crew left Seoul. Now the rain is making the late flight more difficult. Tired and fighting the weather, the captain begins the final approach to the airport. August the 6th, 1997. It's close to 1.30 in the morning. On Korean Airlines Flight 801, a tired captain is preparing to land at Aganya Airport on the island of Guam. In the cabin, 237 passengers are getting ready to begin their holidays or get back to work. The flight, other than the turbulence, was um, totally normal. We had our meals and it was just a totally normal flight in every way. As the jet approaches Guam, an erratic storm pushes rain and clouds between the plane and the airport. It's hard to see. The captain wants to make a small change in course to avoid the worst of the weather. Request 20 mile deviation to the left as we are descending. Guam Center, Korea 801, request deviation 10 miles left of track. Korean Air 801, roger. Veering around cloud cover, Captain Park Yung Chol struggles to get a clear view of his approach. And finally, he sees what he's been looking for. It's Guam. Guam. Good. Today, the weather radar helps us a lot. Korean Air 801 cleared for ILS runway 6, left approach. Glide slope unusable. Air traffic controller Kurt Mayo reminds the crew that the airport's glide slope equipment is out of service. It would normally help them find the runway, but since it's under repair, it isn't sending out any signals. Then, with the crew in the middle of their landing sequence, something unexpected happens. The glide slope appears to come to life. Is the glide slope working? The glide slope, yeah? Yes. Yes, it's working. Why is it working? It's a confusing moment. Unsure what's happening, the crew continue to prepare for their landing. 60 check. Gear down. Check. Approaching 1400. Since today's glide slope condition is not good, we need to maintain 1440. Please set it. Set. At 40 minutes after one in the morning, Guam controller Kurt Mayo once again makes contact with the crew. Korean Air 801, contact the Ganya Tower 118.1. He passes the plane on to the airport tower and says goodbye in Korean. It's the last time he'll ever talk to the crew of the jetliner. The guy working here probably was a GI in Korea before. Aganya Tower, Korean Air 801 to intercept the localizer, six left. Korean Air 801 heavy, Aganya Tower, runway six, clear to land. Korean 801, roger, clear to land, six left. Flap 30, flap 30. As the plane descends, clouds and rain close in again. They've lost sight of the airport. Look carefully. Ladies and gentlemen, we're preparing for landing at Aganya International Airport in Guam. Please return your seats to the upright position, fasten your seatbelt, and prepare for landing. Set 560 feet. 
As the plane flies closer to the ground, the crew expects they'll see the airport any second, but the rain makes it hard to see anything. Isn't the glide slope working? Wiper on. Then a computerized voice fills the cockpit. It's the ground proximity warning system, which tells the crew they're just 500 feet in the air. But they still can't see the runway. I've done this flight many, many times before. And when I estimated we're about 30 seconds from landing, I bent down to put my shoes on. 200. The plane is now just 200 feet above the ground, but still the crew can't see the runway. They're quickly running out of time. Let's make a missed approach. Not inside. Not inside, missed approach. Go around. Perhaps. I had no doubts this was still just a normal landing and the aircraft went on and, and was decelerating quicker than normal, but, but nothing to really alarm me. Things were getting pretty serious then. The aircraft was starting to break apart. So I forced myself up to look, and there was just bottles, bags, everything you can imagine was coming out. The only way I can really describe it is like about a, a thousand 737s landing all at once. On a wooded hillside in Guam, the shattered plane finally grinds to a halt. I was too scared to undo my seatbelt at that stage because I was waiting for the next bounce to go over an extra, another ravine or whatever was going to happen next. Miraculously, 11-year-old Rika Matsuda has survived and is virtually unhurt. But her mother is trapped and injured. Very small is also injured and terrified that fire is sweeping through the plane. The fire started in the front and proceeded to, from the front to the back towards me. There was no floor lighting or anything like that, but the fire was so intense there was no problems to see where I was going. <laughs> If help doesn't arrive soon, those who survived the initial crash may be trapped inside the cabin. Korean Air 801 Heavy Tower, how do you hear? Everyone in the cockpit has been killed. 
But airport authorities still have no idea what's happened aboard Flight 801. Hurt by the crash and desperate to escape the ruined plane, Barry Small stumbles towards an opening in the cabin. I got back these, these six, six, six seats and then there was about a six foot drop down to the ground. The undercarriage had gone completely. I came across an obstacle that I had to, to cross because it was the only part that wasn't burning. Here, go! Rika's mother tells her daughter to get out of the burning plane. Go. Go. Go, go now, get out of here. Go. Now go, go. You must go. Go. You must go, go now. Go. The fire is spreading quickly. As passengers struggle to deal with the disaster, rescue workers don't even know the plane's gone down. The fire engulfed both the Asian gentleman and myself to the extent that it burnt my arms and my watch got that hot it was mounting into my skin, into my flesh and I had to flick it off. Minutes earlier, Kurt Mayo had passed the passenger jet onto the local tower controllers. Now he learns it hasn't landed yet. Approach again, did Korean Air come back to you? No. I cleared him to land and I don't know where he's at. He didn't land? Oh my God. Within minutes, Guam Fire Chief Chuck Sanchez is en route. I was thinking, my God, 747, where is it at? Is it on island, is it on sea? Uh, what is the plan here? fell off the side of the container and the Asian gentleman disappeared into the jungle. So I rolled over onto my back and I managed to crawl with my elbows. There was still a bit of skin on my elbows left. Small has a badly broken right leg. He crawls away from the wreckage. Many more people remain trapped inside. Lying there, it just sounded like a battlefield. It was just like a movie. Things were exploding short of me, going over the top of me. Things were landing beside us on fire. It's just indescribable. There's only one way for emergency crews to get down to the wreck site along a single access road that runs beside Nimitz Hill. As they race to the accident scene, rescue workers discover a major obstacle. A pipeline has been ripped out of the ground by the crash and thrown across the road. There's no way around it. Having heard about the crash, the island's governor, Carl Guterres, has joined the rescue team. Engine Company 7, get this thing out of the way. You guys, get the medic kits and come with me. We reached the closest point of approach to the crash site, which was up the hill, and probably about another 150 yards downhill. I, you know, gentlemen, uh, turn on whatever lights you got to uh, guide us down this path, and uh, let's let's do it. We started running and just listening to the screams. 
so that we can guide ourselves uh, because there was just nothing but overgrowth on the side of the road. Uh, at one point, I stopped him. I go, Governor, um, sir, I need you to make some serious decision in this operation, and I don't think I want you to move further. Uh, I'd like for you to stay on this side, and uh, you know, I don't want you to get hurt. You know, let us do this job. He goes, no, I want to help you guys. At the site of the crash, flames are devouring the wreckage. <laughs> Hampered by his broken leg, Small can only look on as people cry out for help. I lay at that bank for the whole night during that time, hearing people call out in a foreign language, which initially sounded like good, healthy calls for help, then turn into screams as the fire got more intense. And after a period of time, the fire even grew worse, and the screams faded away. Finally, almost an hour after the accident, Sanchez's crew reaches the site. I split them up into two rescue and search units. I need half of you guys to start from the tail end, and I need the other half to start from the front end of this plane. And let's meet in the middle, and. Uh, you know, let's do what we can to help the survivors here. Guam's governor, Carl Guterres, sees Rika Matsuda all alone and crying out for her mother. I'm crying, little angel. Everything will be OK. I did not dare let her go. It's something that I almost like there was a bond between me and that young that little girl. And I found out later she was 11, but she looked really smaller than 11 years old. Fire Chief Chuck Sanchez finds Barry Small in the sword grass. <laughs> he gave me his fire jacket and put it under my head to comfort me. Here I go. All right, let's go. Later on, he was very distressed that he had to come back and get it back because he was getting burnt, dragging people and bodies out of the aircraft. We were cutting trees to use for splint. Uh, we were taking off our uh, protective gears to uh, cover the survivors. It's clear to rescue personnel that for many, they've arrived too late. But Sanchez isn't giving up. He sends a team to search further into the wreckage. Group two, start at the tail and work forward. Go. What I heard was this large explosion, man, right where they were at. Benigo, did we lose our people? A Boeing 747 has crashed on a rugged hillside in Guam, just a few miles short of the airport. There were 254 people on board. Rescue workers comb through the wreckage when an explosion rips through the remains of the plane. No radio transmission at all. We lost all transmission. And uh, then finally, somebody came out. Um, Sir, we're OK. Uh, we survived the explosion. Uh, everybody's accounted for. It's not until the dawn finally comes that rescue workers can see the extent of the damage. The plane has spilled down the mountain and broken into several large pieces. Only 26 people survived the disaster. Friends and family are desperate for any news.
Many bodies are badly burned. Although most of the passengers are Korean, Sean Burke and his girlfriend Wendy Bunton are among a few Americans on the flight. Thousands of kilometers away, news of the crash reaches Sean's parents. When she hears about the crash, Sean Burke's stepmother doesn't know if Sean is alive or dead. He could have been uh, burned in the crash. He could be unconscious in a local hospital there. And we just wanted to go over and bring him back. So, I mean, because that kept going through our minds that he possibly could be laying on the hillside. Since Guam is an American territory, the responsibility for investigating the crash falls to the National Transportation Safety Board. Greg Fife is the lead investigator. When he arrives on the site, he has to contend with more than just the carnage of the plane crash. Grieving family members surround the scene, making it especially difficult for investigators to work. As an accident investigator, you have to keep your emotions in check. It's like being a doctor in an ER room. You, have, you, you see this devastation, you see this tragedy unfolding in front of you. You hear about all of the, the sad stories, especially when there are kids and, and innocent people involved. And as an accident investigator, you have to keep those emotions in check because you have to remain objective, you have to remain emotionless to be able to do your job effectively. And we had a whole building full of people just like us. They were all grieving and crying out. It was just horrible. One of the first things we did was we went out on site and we did a, what we call a site survey. We had to really get an understanding of what we were dealing with as far as the wreckage and how we were going to conduct the on-scene investigation. During the preliminary investigation, Fife finds that large sections of the plane are almost completely intact. The airplane landed relatively under control. That is, that the pilot basically landed the airplane into the trees and into that terrain. Unfortunately, it was three miles from the airport. Investigators find a number of items that survived the crash and the fire that followed, including the landing chart the crew was using as it approached Guam Airport. Investigators also find Captain Park's travel bag, and in it discover a small plastic pill container. Captain Park had been prescribed a variety of drugs, including pills containing benzodiazepine, a class of drugs often used as a sedative. The pills and tissue samples from Captain Park's remains are sent for analysis. The landing chart becomes part of a growing pile of evidence. Using information from the jet's flight data recorder, investigators recreate the plane's flight path. The relatively gentle slope of its descent supports Fyth's belief that the jet all but landed on the hillside. But the flight path shouldn't look like this. Korean Air 801 cleared for ILS, runway 6, left approach. Glide slope unusable. Korean 801, roger, clear for ILS, runway 6, left. The crew had been told that the glide slope at the airport wasn't working. It meant that the captain had to take more manual control of his plane. It is now up to the pilot to fly an established procedure called a step down, where he starts at an altitude of, say, 2,000 feet. He, when, when he gets to a particular point located by what they call DME, or distance measuring equipment, he then starts a descent to another prescribed altitude. If the crew was following the step down procedure, 
its flight path would resemble a set of stairs. But after the first step, the plane enters a long, slow descent. If you don't hit those step downs, and those altitudes are prescribed to give you terrain clearance, if you don't fly that, as depicted on the approach chart, you run the risk of flying into an obstruction or high terrain. The plane's cockpit voice recorder has also been recovered from the debris. Fife and his team begin to analyze it, hoping to better understand what happened in the cockpit. Set 563. On two separate occasions, Captain Park gave orders to descend long before he was supposed to. But there are other clues on the tape as well. The cockpit voice recorder provided us, the investigators, quite a bit of information. But one of the key elements that we found was that the flight crew appeared to be tired. Really sleepy. And this was a chartered flight, so it would have put them on what we call backside of the clock flying. That is, they wouldn't be normally flying during the day, they are now flying at night. And typically your body says you should be asleep when it's dark outside. The sedatives could have made a difficult situation even worse. But when the lab results come back, they're conclusive. While he had the pills with him, there are no traces of them in Captain Park's system. When lead investigator Greg Fife returns to the cockpit voice recorder, he focuses on the captain's discussion of the glide slope. Is the glide slope working? The glide slope, yeah? Yes. Yes, it's working. Why is it working? He started to see the glide slope needle move a little bit and started to question the other crew members as to whether or not the glide slope was actually working or not. It's early in the morning. After a long flight, Captain Park is tired, perhaps confused and distracted by the unexpected readings on his glide slope. It became very apparent listening to the cockpit voice recorder that in fact he got fixated but Fife still doesn't understand why Park's glide slope appeared to be working. Was there a problem on this plane? Or is the equipment susceptible to problems that could affect other jets as well? To find out, he brings in navigation expert Nelson Spornheimer. I spent some time looking at the transcript, uh, trying to determine what the navigation issues were, why the, a good airplane was in the wrong place and to investigate the apparent confusion on the part of the crew who thought that the glide slope was working at least part of the time. Spornheimer sends a team of investigators to Guam. They fly over the island, trying to determine whether radio signals from a nearby military base could have acted on the plane, making it seem like the glide slope was working. Glide slope receivers can respond to non-glide slope signals, particularly when the intended glide slope signal is absent. If, if there are spurious signals on the channel and they contain the right information, they can cause intermittent movements of the glide slope needle. Set 560 feet. But the signals wouldn't be sustained. Like a light switch turning quickly on and off, the glide slope indicator would give periodic indications that it was working, but not for long. My conclusion was that spurious signals, whether they be from other transmitters or failed ground equipment, such as personal walkie-talkies, could not cause a sustained warning flag movement. If the glide slope wasn't fully operating, why did Park believe it was? And even if he did believe it was working, why did he crash into Nimitz Hill? Isn't the glide slope working? Wiper on. As investigators continue to try to piece together the causes of the crash, Barry Small is trying to understand why he and 25 others survived. I went to touch my shoes, we hit the ground, and I was accidentally in the perfect crash position by some, some sort of miracle. An airline engineering apprentice and helicopter pilot, Small understands airplanes. I do firmly believe there are some changes that could be made to aircraft. Small believes that the way crossbars are built into aircraft seats caused one of his legs to break. 
but luck saved his other leg. My right leg went forward and crashed into the bar in front of the seat and broke. And my left leg was saved by my carry bag, stopping my leg going forward and hit that bar. Still able to walk on his one good leg, small escapes while others remain trapped inside. Since she's young, Rika Matsuda's legs are shorter than a normal adult. Sitting normally, her legs wouldn't have been pressed against the crossbar on impact, so she was able to escape the plane. Oh, well, now get out of here. While her mother died. Small is also convinced that the flames that first spread through the cabin of Korean Air Flight 801 were preventable. They estimate that those top lockers had over 462 litres of burnable alcohol on board. Had the plane been full, it could be at least twice that amount. During the crash, Small believes that the duty-free alcohol mixed with oxygen in the plane's ceiling. The combination ignited with deadly results. It's a fire he thinks could have been prevented. Why have this risk, alcohol and oxygen? I thought, you know, for aircraft's about safety, and this is a, just a blatant breaking of the rules of safety as far as I'm concerned. As he continues to recover from the accident, Small is determined to prevent what had happened to him from happening to others. He decides to push for changes on how seats are made and how duty-free alcohol is stored. For NTSB investigator Greg Fyth, the biggest question still remains. How did an experienced pilot, one recently honored by his company for his safety record, crash his plane five kilometers short of the airport? As the investigation continues, he discovers that the landing chart the crew was using was more than six months old and out of date. It's an indication that the crew could have been better prepared for the landing. When he reviews the training practices for Korean Airlines, Fife uncovers more gaps in the information that the crew received. We found that the Korean Airlines flight crew had all of their training based on airports with approaches where the DME was always co-located at the airport. DME is distance measuring equipment, electronic beacons that tell pilots where they are in relation to the airport. Often the final beacon is found at the foot of the runway. That was not the case in Guam. The airport was in fact five kilometers further on. Struggling to see through the rain, Park was unable to find the airport. Distracted by the unexpected glide slope readings, Park used the final beacon as a guide, expecting it to take him right to the runway. Let's make a missed approach. Not inside. Not inside. Missed approach. Go around. Go around. Perhaps. It's clear that Flight A01 flew an approach about three miles premature. In other words, the descent was about three miles early. It was a nominal approach otherwise, just to the wrong location. We think that based on fatigue and um, some of their training, that in fact, when the flight crew crashed the airplane, when the counter got to zero, they thought the airport should be there. A fully loaded 747 weighs more than 200,000 kilograms. Like an enormous ocean liner, it can't change course quickly. Blinded by rain and relying on their equipment, the crew of Korean Air Flight 801 thought they were heading straight at the runway. When they realized something was wrong, it was too late. As the investigation continues, Fife and his team make a startling discovery. 
Equipment that would have given the crew more time to react had been disabled on purpose. In August of 1997, the crash of Korean Air Flight 801 took the lives of more than 200 people. The final accident investigation report is published more than two years after the crash. It lays blame on the Korean Airlines training methods and the crew's over-reliance on the jet's automation. But it also has sharp words reserved for the FAA, the body that regulates air travel in the United States. Because of an FAA decision, a critical piece of technology that could have saved Flight 801 was intentionally disabled. The Minimum Safe Altitude Warning System, or MSOAR, is a standard piece of equipment at major American airports. But in Guam, the FAA had made a critical alteration to the way it was used. MSOR uses radar to watch the planes as they come into the airport. If they're too low, a warning is given to air traffic controllers, who can then relay it to the crew. But in Guam, the system kept giving nuisance readings to controllers. The controllers kept getting these nuisance warnings. They redesigned the software and moved the limitations of the MSAW further away from the airport where it afforded no one a level of protection. Instead of watching the planes as they neared the airport, the system in Guam now tracked them when they were more than 80 kilometers away over the ocean. I think the best way to describe that would have been and should be irresponsible because you've taken this system that was designed as a level of protection, not only for the controller, but you've taken the protection away from the flying public. For the passengers and crew of Flight 801, the lack of the MSOR system sealed their fate. If the system had been working, the crash could have been avoided. Without it, the crew had no warning at all. The two pilots didn't want to die. They had families. No one wanted to die. Um, we still do not blame them. Is The bottom line is nobody wanted to be in that situation. It was just something that happened. For Barry Small, the years since the crash of Flight 801 have been emotional and frustrating. The Civil Aviation Authority in his homeland of New Zealand has acknowledged the potential danger posed by duty-free liquor on board. But so far, no policies have been changed. His desire to modify airplane seat design has also been ignored. I have taken several steps to um, put this idea forward. And in a lot of cases, it's initially met, it, met with enthusiasm but it eventually ends up in the too hard basket. And when I try to approach seat design people, there's no one wants to hear about it. Sean Burke was never officially identified as a victim of Flight 801. Wendy Bunton was positively identified, but DNA samples only proved that a white male was on the plane near her. Bill and I never gave up hope um, that Sean had survived the crash. Um, even after we came home for, I would say, a year or two, every time the phone rang, every time somebody knocked on the door, um, we expected a phone message saying, hi, Dad, this is your son, Sean. Eventually, several years after the crash, Barry Small was able to give Kathy Burke and her husband some sense of finality and an enduring image of their son. When we met him and he wanted to tell us that in the 12 hour layover in Seoul, he was wandering around and finally heard two people speaking English. And he said they were so much in love that he did not want to interrupt their conversation. For Sean's father, 
the deep sorrow of the crash will never completely leave. For me, the grief of Sean's loss never ends. Hasn't gotten better, hasn't gotten worse. Just another day. Uh, for everybody else, it's gone. You know, I expect people to move on, but I'll be the, this way till the day I'm, I'm with him again. For Barry Small, there is anger too, but also incredible gratitude for surviving. So many people have told me that I survived for a reason. I've been searching for that reason for nine years now. And I truly believe if someone would listen to my story about the oxygen and alcohol and the improvement of the seats, that I could justify in my own mind that I don't have to feel guilty about surviving. <laughs>